Stay tuned for Mark Levine. He'll be up next with a great show. So don't go anywhere. Thanks so much, guys. We'll see you next week. America. Welcome to the Rockus Caucus. This is Mark Levine, and I have on the line my two compatriots in crime here. Uh, Garland Nixon, are you there, sir? I certainly, I think I am. I'm not 100% sure. I'll let you know at the end of the show. I believe I hear you. Whether you're actually there or not is a completely different psychological question. Terry D. Kester, are you there, sir? I am beyond there. I am with you in every way, Mark. That sounds even more scary. All right, so we got both of you on the line here. Got a lot to talk about. Uh, we're going to go around the globe today. I want to start with the situation in Syria and uh, the uh, likelihood or lack thereof of chemical weapons being found there and where the United States will finally get involved. Something I've been arguing for for a long time, and both of you have been arguing against me for a long time. I want to see if your minds have been changed. And then, Terry, we're going to move on and talk about slavery in Bangladesh, uh, which, uh, of course, yeah. is, is a real bad problem, working conditions. But, hey, I get my clothing from there, so shouldn't I want the slavery? Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Well, and, yeah, you sound like a good American. <laughs> <laughs> Typical, right? And then yeah. Garland uh, was going to move on and talk about all kinds of conspiracy theories outside of Syria and Bangladesh, uh, bringing oh, us home to Boston and 9-11. And uh, you and I are going to talk about some, some real ho- things going around, horrible things around the globe. And Garland will tell us all the things that other people are scared about that may not even be happening. So we, we've got a big show ahead today. Let me give out the number for those who want to join in at 202-889-9797. You too can join the Rockets Caucus. Um, let me just say, though, before I get started in Syria, that right now, starting right now at 12 noon, there are activists for Free Syria protesting in front of the White House, and you too can join that. You can still listen to the Rockets Caucus. Just tune on your radio to AM 1480. Uh, you can listen to us on the web, uh, on um, my website, marklivingtalk.com, so you can hear the show while you're out there protesting, but if you believe, as I do, although I'm not so sure Carl and Terry do, that the United States needs to take a more active involvement to help stop the murders in Syria, uh, go out there. Um, a lot of uh, people, Syrian Americans, uh, Syrians, and, and just ordinary Americans like me who uh, really just want to do something to stop the killing. Again, that protest at the White House from 12 noon till 2, and uh, starting at 1 o'clock when the inside scoop begins, we're going to have some of those protesters on the show talking about, well, what, what they're fighting for. So, gentlemen, let, let me start in Syria. Uh, you know, about a year, year and a half ago, I started arguing to you folks that the United States should get more involved. I, I argued for a no-fly zone, much like we did in Libya. I argued that the people of, Lib- of Syria were ordinary people. They were not terrorists. They were ordinary shopkeepers and school teachers and people that just wanted to live an ordinary life, free from dictatorship. Uh, and they were fighting. And that if the United States did not help them, what would happen is a bunch of uh, radical cool al-Qaeda types would. And, of course, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, now we have what's becoming almost a full-scale war in the Middle East. You've got a Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and, interestingly, Israel on the side of the rebels against Hezbollah, Assad, Russia, and Iran on the side of the government. 70,000, at least 70,000 Syrians are dead. Now they say up to 100,000. Uh, the regime regularly kills men, women, and children. There's 4.5 million Syrian people who are out of their homes. Uh, One million are out of Syria. Basically, all the good, normal people are leaving the country, and now it's becoming a battle between al-Qaeda and, uh, and, and the government, uh, which none of, neither side I like very much. Uh, so to me, that's all hindsight that we should have helped them when we had the chance. Last, last point before I get you too involved is the Obama administration said there are going to be red lines. Red lines if Assad, the dictator of Syria, starts to use chemical weapons against his own people. That would be a game changer, said the president. Uh, Now, Britain and France and Israel have all put forward evidence of uh, chemical weapons, and Obama may do something. He's still studying the issue, but it seems to me that his red line and his game changing, if that doesn't hold true, uh, we're going to have a lot of people not believing the president on anything. So, who wants to go first? Oh, let me jump in. All right, go ahead. 
Okay, because it's such a big context that has to be realized in this. If you look at the Iraq war, as a, for instance, um, of our involvement, the Iraq situation is we were the suppliers of Iraq's, um, you know, weapons for years, for decades. And um, then, well, you know, when we finally went into the war, it was because, you know, Hussein had been acting supposedly on himself, etc. And uh, it wasn't such an international problem at that time. Um, and the same was true in Afghanistan. The Russian said, of course, was withdrawn years ago. We had withdrawn years ago before that. The Taliban was the enemy, etc. cetera. I mentioned Al-Qaeda, of course, as well. This situation is so totally different, it requires a great deal of caution, and I admire President Obama for doing that. The primary problem is, or one of the primary problems, there are so many. A, is it's so interlinked with the Mideast, with Hezbollah, etc., it also is linked with Russia. Russia is the one who has been, since ever since Israel bombed the uh, supposed uh, nuclear power plant in Syria that may or may not have been a pharmacy or whatever the heck it was, Russia has been the primary supplier of weapons in Syria. Actually, and, uh, just to correct you, Terry, Russia has been supplying Syria for about 50 years. So uh, yeah, well, I, know. I, 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 don't, I don't want to suggest that it happened just because Israel took out a nuclear plant. I mean, this no, has been no, happening and, for, for many decades, just, just right, to correct you there. It escalated to air defense. Um, from that point on. And Russia, in a sense, is the enemy here. I mean, it really honestly is. And that's where we've got to apply all the pressure we possibly can, which is very risky because Russia has so much oil and gas, which supplies Europe. This whole thing is so frigging complex that it is a very dangerous situation. And I don't know of a good solution except the international community, except the United Nations, and except stopping Russia. How do we stop Russia? The problem is not Syria. The problem is Russia. Well, I have some. I have some responses, but let me get Garland in here. Go ahead, Garland. Yeah, I, I would also say this. Here's the other issue that we've got to think about because we've been down this road before in Afghanistan. Um, one of the considerations is fighting alongside the, you know, Al Qaeda to overthrow um, the Syrian regime. Clearly, you know, Al Qaeda. Um, and 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 uh, you know, light minds uh, in in the Middle East um, welcome any kind of a power vacuum because they see that as an opportunity to to move a theocracy into place. So, I, I you know, I can I can very well understand that President Obama is extremely hesitant to take military action. You can wait and wait. You know, you can you can hesitate taking the action, but once you take it, you know, you can't pull back from that. Because you're there. So do we supply arms at, such as we did to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and possibly um, train people who are going to come use those very arms to come back against us, who we may use them against Israel, God only knows who, you know, who they'll use them against, anybody they're unhappy with, any of the other maybe governments that they're unhappy with in the area. So do we supply people with weapons that will be, that will be turned back on us, number one? And number two, um, ultimately... I, I think the consideration is, where is this thing going? And I think that is the fear and hesitation that's being, that's creating the fear and hesitation in the international community. Because President Obama is not the only world leader who is holding back, who is hesitant. Well, actually, England and France are pushing us to take action. Uh, and Turkey is as well, and so is Jordan, and so is Saudi Arabia, and so is Qatar. So uh, the only people that are really opposed to us taking action are the people who are on the side of, of the dictator Assad, Russia, Iran, uh, Hezbollah. But uh, certainly Turkey and Jordan, which are moderate, um, Muslim countries. Turkey, of course, is a democracy, and uh, Jordan is a, a relatively benign uh, monarchy. Uh, our, our countries are being destabilized by the refugees. Uh, it seems to me that all of our friends uh, want us to take action, and the only people who don't want us to take action are our enemies. You know what it might really come down to, guys, and this is really, really huge, is somehow that we as a government, which I know is extremely risky, everything in this is risky, we've got to deal with the Islamic community somehow or other. Because if there's to be a stop of this, it should be the Muslims, the Islamic community, that should stop it somehow or other. But they are so divided between Shia and Shia. I'm just going to say, there's not one Muslim community. I know, I know. <laughs> That's and the problem. And this is part of the huge problem. So, I mean, it's not, there's not a win-win situation in this, but somehow the Islamic community, the Muslim community, that, but that becomes a problem with the Arab community, et cetera, et cetera. But, but here's the thing, Terry. Somehow Jared. there has to be some unity in the area 
to do I something. think there is largely unity. Uh, if you look at the, the Syrian people, overwhelmingly want Assad gone. If you look at uh, Arab Americans, they overwhelmingly want Assad gone. If you look at our allies, uh, whether you look at our Arab allies in, in Jordan, uh, our Turkish allies, our Israeli allies, or our European allies, everyone, and even President Obama has said that he wants Assad gone. It seems to me, though, that President Obama has had this idea that if we did nothing, the war would suddenly simmer and go away. I it seems to so. me, well, no. but here's my, my, my concern is that by doing nothing, we've actually made the problem worse. That had we acted a year ago, had we had a strong no-fly zone when Syrian aircraft started bombing and killing the Syrian people, uh, had, then we would have been on the right side of history for once, which would be nice to have the American people actually on the side of people fighting for democracy. Al-Qaeda was non-existent in Syria two years ago. Absolutely what do you think non-existent. What would do if we'd started attacking Syria? Nothing. You really think so? Yes, they didn't do anything and, and in if Libya. It, if it involved NATO and Russia's controlling all that well, let me, gas let me, let me give you I, oil. Let me give you what I think is a, is a very clear precedent, and that's the precedent in Kosovo. So Russia was arming Serbia. Serbia was Russia's longtime ally. ally. Ru- Serbia has been an ally of Russia since uh, before World War I. So this is a much longer-term alliance than one with Syria, and frankly one that Russia cares a lot more about because Serbia and Kosovo were a lot closer to Russia's borders than Syria. What do we do? It, the Serbia started massacring, uh, committing genocide against the, the Muslim uh, Kosovars, and we went in and Bill Clinton, I, I know th- there's no such thing as a perfect war, but uh, I would say one of the best uh, done wars there was, we did air power, we lost, I believe, one U.S. plane, we freed an entire nation from genocide, that's, that's an independent country today, it's very peaceful and prosperous and, and is thankful to America, and we didn't do it for oil, we did it to save people's lives. I think that's the precedent, and I Except really don't... The whole I, situation with Russia yeah. has changed. Yeah, but I don't... It did not have the oil and gas reserves that it has then. Oh, has sure. Today. Let me get to Garland, though. Go yeah, ahead, I Garland. Think, yeah, I, I don't necessarily agree with Terry. I, I kind of agree with Mark when it comes to Russia. I don't see where... Because of Russia's economic interest, I don't see Russia itching to get into any kind of a military confrontation with anyone, least of all the U.S. Right now, you know, they're... Their economy is building, and they've got a lot of money coming in in, in oil and gas, and, and um, they don't want to get into a military confrontation that's going to that's going to no, but an economic confrontation. Plus, they, they don't want the entire Arab world to be mad at them. That's the other thing. I mean, if Russia comes down with a heavy hand, they can do that in Chechnya and Dagestan. Obviously, I think it's awful what they've done there, but that's within the boundaries of Russia, and no one can really complain. If they were to take a heavy hand in supporting the dictatorship in Syria, the entire Muslim world, which is already kind of upset because of Chechnya and Dagestan, would immediately become anti-Russia. I don't think Russia cares that much. They'll arm Syria, to be sure, but right. I don't think they'll do, it, do anything more. I mean, But I'm not saying that they would do something militarily. They don't have to do anything What, what are you suggesting? They control the oil and the gas that's taking care of half of Europe. They're going to cut off oil and gas supplies to Europe? They've Is that really what you're suggesting? They, yeah, nah, they haven't even threatened that. Again, if they cut it off, they're actually selling that stuff to Europe. Right, they're it helps them. Away. Right. So if, they, if they cut it off, that means they cut off money coming in to Russia, and I certainly don't think that they're going to do that. Uh, the no, thing to keep in mind here is... To any of the NATO countries is, look, if you guys get involved in this and you support this, we're go- all you have to do is make the threat. The Europeans can't afford that. Well, but they threat. haven't made that threat. This has been going on for a year. The idea, at least, of taking action has been going for a year. Well, they uh, they've done it to Estonia. Well, but and Estonia is was within the Soviet Union. I mean, I look, I was I, was right, but I, I just think Estonia is a much more important interest to, to Russia than, than Syria is. Let me make one last point, and then I'll let you both go at it. And that is the point of, frankly, President Obama's credibility. So he set this red line. It's, it's not my red line, to be fair. I, I would have acted, as you know, a year, a year and a half ago. I advocated that right here on the Rockus Caucus. But Obama set this red line. He said, if they use chemical weapons, that's our red line. That's a game changer. That would change everything that would get us involved and uh what happened obama called his bluff i mean uh, i'm mean, excuse me Assad called obama's bluff maybe obama was bluffing in the hopes that they wouldn't use these awful things uh, frankly I, personally i don't really care whether they murder uh, tens of thousands of people conventionally or through chemical weapons i think it's awful no matter how you die but whatever obama set this red line if he does not enforce his own red line is that not a message to North Korea, to Iran, and not to mention to the Republicans that, frankly, Obama's red lines 
are not so red and not such a line. And the, well, the question there's is, there's nothing quite is, so tragic. There's nothing quite so tragic as going to war for political reasons. This is isn't is political. This isn't political reasons. No, 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 no. The politics are against me. The American people don't want us to go get involved in Syria. I recognize that. I'm no, arguing something that's is, impolitic. The, I agree. But the point is, the point is, it, like you brought in the idea of the Republicans, it'll be used ex- extraordinarily viciously against Obama if the things get worse. The point is, when we go into war for political reasons, which would become a political reason because the Republicans are attacking him and would attack him in the election, that's the wrong reason to go to no, war. But if we're going to solve this, if we're going to solve this, we have to get some other country. Oh, I agree Israel. it should be multilateral. I agree. Yeah, should Britain well, and France sure. be, yeah, and Italy should join with other, us. I agree with that, but they will. Other, we've got to get some other Mid-Eastern country. Saudi Arabia and America. Qatar will join with us. No doubt about it. They're just looking we'll, for U.S. leadership. Saudi Arabia and Qatar, they're already arming the rebels. I guarantee you they will join with us. Uh, they... <laughs> Absolutely. Let them take the lead. Then. Well, they can't take the lead because they don't have that much power. But let me let me go to Garland because I want Garland. If you'll address the red line issue, once a president makes a, a ruling, sets a red line, even if it's one we don't agree with, doesn't he have to keep up on it or, or lose his credibility? No. Well, let me get Garland's view on that. Go ahead, Garland. Garland. I knew Garland agreed with me. No, Garland's running and hiding. Where are you, Garland? <laughs> He's he's deep in, he's deep in thought, knowing that at my point. I, d- I, I don't know. Maybe we <laughs> lost. We maybe we lost Garland. Did, uh, but it, it it is frightening because I mean you know what kind of a he shouldn't have made that kind of statement to begin with. I mean it's a stupid statement to make. You know for any conflict situation to say okay here's my line line in the sand. You know then of course you're forced into some kind of chaos and everybody's going to push and play. It's a plain chicken. It's politically stupid to do that. Now that he's done well, it's, it... Again, I wouldn't have set that red line either. But now that he's done it, doesn't he have to stand by it? No, but he does have to have, have something happen. You're absolutely right in that regard. Something has to happen. Something has to change. You know, whether it's Turkish troops getting involved, whether it's Saudi Arabian troops getting involved, something has to happen there. We have to push for it. There's no question about that. But we can't stand up and take the lead because it's going to backfire. Well, okay, well, and this I agree with you. And again, Garland, if you're listening, come back in and join the conversation. Otherwise, we'll get you back after the commercial break. Uh, but uh, one thing I do agree with you, Terry, is it has to be an international effort. I don't think that's hard to do. It will not, however, be United Nations effort. The, the, the Russia has a veto still in yep. the United Nations, and it ain't going to happen. And to even suggest it's going to happen is it's disingenuous. We all know Russia won't allow it to happen. But again, I use Kosovo as my example. We did that through NATO. We did that without a United Nations resolution. England and France have been chopping at the bit uh, to do something. Turkey and Jordan have been pushing us to do something. And Saudi Arabia and Qatar have been secretly funneling arms to the rebels for at least a year now. And the way I see it is this Assad is going to leave power. I, I, I predict this. I, I don't doubt it for a bit. I don't know whether it's going to happen a month from now or a year from now. But, but within five years equation. from now, he's you going know, to be left gone. out of the equation Iran and what's really going to happen. Well, Iran is basically invading Syria right now. They've got Hezbollah in there on the ground. They've got Iranian elements on the ground doing their best to, to defend Assad. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, what you're going to possibly threaten here is if, if this gets the least bit out of hand, you have a world war in the Middle East. I wouldn't call and it a world, war, a world but, war, but it's already happening. See, here's the thing. I, I think, Terry, when you say things like that, you make it sound like if we don't get involved, it's not already a world war. When Israel, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan, Hezbollah, Iran, and Syria are already involved, it's already a war going on it in the Middle is, East. But there's a big difference between unleashing the dogs of war and having the dogs chewing on the edges. And once we unleash the dogs of war in that big uh, in that big an area and with the resources that are there, you have a conflict that is going to be a worldwide disaster. Yeah, see, I think the dogs have already been unleashed. I think they're barking, I think they're biting, and I think they're killing. Well, because we haven't destroyed anything economically yet. And are you, you kidding me? Syria war, almost doesn't... Wait, wait, Syria almost doesn't exist anymore. Aleppo, the largest city, I'm is in ruins. I'm not talking about Syria. I'm talking about every other country that would be involved and be attacked. I'm talking about supplying the, the world with half of its oil. You know, you have a world war going on in that area. You are going to paralyze the country. You talk about a depression. You're talking about the United States? You hurt our economy? Yes. Do you think think we don't need their oil yet? Do you think we're independent? No, I don't think we're independent. But look, Saudi Arabia's got, it it supports us on this. They've got plenty of oil. They've got more than enough to match anything Russia gives us. I'm not worried about that. If you have Iran fighting on Saudi Arabia and Turkey fighting Saudi Iran and everything else, I mean, this is is not 
just a backyard fight. But it's already happening. That's, I guess, where you and I no, disagree, Terry. No, it's not Terry. happening militarily. It's happening in Syria. And it's happening right. politically. Right. And it's happening with little... And it's happening things. in Lebanon, too, by the way, not just Syria. Yeah. It's already spilled yeah. over to there. But it's not got the major countries heavily involved openly with troops on the ground, et cetera. Russia's... Not, I, I, okay, now, uh, so let me be clear. I'm not supporting troops on the ground. I'm not supporting United States troops on the ground. I'm not supporting... Uh, and I don't think we need to have troops on the ground. You realize I, we've said that about every single war we've ever been in, including World War II? We didn't put troops on the ground in Kosovo. That's my <laughs> example. And we had very few troops on the ground in Libya. Uh, now, you, I mean, Iraq and Af- see, here's here's what I think is going on here. It's it's very interesting to me that you mentioned Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I and I think the American people are right with you, Terry. I do. I, I admit I'm outside public opinion here because people say, well, this is the same as Iraq. This is it, it's not the same as Iraq. In Iraq, we invaded a country that didn't want us there, and we did so largely for oil revenue and things like that. Here, the people are begging us not to send troops, and we should never send troops, but to stop the Syrian air force from bombing its own people. And uh, I think they're they're already getting very very angry that? at us. How do you do? That? Hey guys, I'm I'm back. Sorry, I lost you there for a few. Yeah, seconds. where you been? I, I, no, no, Garland, we we solved the problems. Where have you been? I should have known. I, yeah. I I need to turn on CNN and I, I'll see a banner across. Yeah, Syrian yeah, we, Syrian problem solved on We Act Radio. <laughs> there is. There I is see the banner now. I think Garland was running and hiding from the hard discussion. Is what was really <laughs> happening here. Uh, guys, you know me. That you know me pretty well. Don't you, uh, apparently, well, I, I, you, you you lucked out because it's the end of my 20 minutes. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to move into Terry's topic, uh, something about slavery in Bangladesh. Sounds pretty scary. We'll be right back with more of the Raucous Caucus coming up right after this. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM. Welcome back to the Rockus Caucus. This is Mark Levine with uh, the newly found Garland Nixon. Are you there, sir? I am here. Okay, and also Terry DeKester, you are there. Oh, you better believe it. Garland, what happened to you? Uh, I got a, a phone around with my phone there, and I think I uh, accidentally restarted it. <laughs> Garland has yet to learn about modern technology. All right, that, that's fine. Now, Terry, um, uh, someone who's also living in the past, that's a terrible segue, but I'm doing my best, uh, <laughs> is, is Bangladesh. Uh, there's still slavery there? Tell me about that. Well, I think it has to do with part of this is inspired because, and just give me a minute here, is inspired because uh, I have begun to um, re- perform it once again in reenactments as Tobias Lear, George Washington's um, uh, aide de camp and secretary, and therefore the slavery issue of constantly comes up in the presentations that I'm doing. Right now, we know you're old enough to remember slavery. We get it, but uh, yeah, is, is yeah. there still <laughs> is there you, still yes. slavery in Bangladesh? Because what, what? Yeah. I thought is, it was I thought it was just a nasty labor dispute. But you're actually yeah, saying yeah. it's slavery. That's what that's what we would love to think, wouldn't it? We tend to think of slavery, you know, as, as, as in the historic context only that we were involved in, with you know African Americans being shipped over by hundreds and ships and all of that, and Ch- whips and chains, auctions and everything else, which is certainly part of the picture. But what slavery is, and I'm so proud of uh, Pope Francis for. Uh, I'm bringing this up. Slavery still exists because slavery is nothing more than commerce run amok. And that's exactly what's happening here worldwide, whether it's the stripping all the way from unions. There's no doubt, and we've said it before on this show, that if private industry has the option of just use having slave labor, they will take so, that So option. be specific, Terry. Tell us exactly what's going on in Bangladesh right now. Well, what's going on in Bangladesh, it's going on in Bangladesh. It's American companies that basically are supporting the whole billion-dollar, two-billion-dollar industry of garment production in Bangladesh. We are the ones. We Americans are the ones. Our companies, our government et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are the ones saying, sure, you can pay people 18 cents an hour, put them in totally unsafe conditions, let them get 500 and some odd killed, and not give a damn because we've got another place right next door that we can do the same thing to the people. Is that any different from what American companies are doing in China, India, or Mexico? No. Okay, so there's basically slavery in all those countries. We will always go towards, companies will always go towards the cheapest possible labor they can get. And if that means enslaving people or oppressing people, at any degree, in any way, they will do it. So who's the criminal in here? Yes, the people in Bangladesh didn't do enough, but the real criminal are the commerce people that drove the situation, which was the same situation in the United States 200, 300 years ago. It wasn't that the British government went around saying, let's have slaves. It's the East India Tea Company, et cetera. Etc. It's the sugar companies. It's all these private organizations, 
private money-making, profit-making organizations that drive oppression and suppression of the human race. And the other day, last show, or a couple shows ago, we were talking about not going to Walmart. So fine, I made the pledge. I go to Costco. I buy a pair of jeans. I bring them home. Where the hell are they made? Bangladesh. Bangladesh. You're right. You can't win for losing. Garland. No, but I mean, this is a worldwide problem, and now there's the immigration policy in the United States, which has gone from pluralism, populism, to bringing in only specified, highly qualified people because we've got the cheap labor out there in some other countries and we don't have to worry about it. And this okay. is a moral, political, and economic issue that we have to face. Let me bring Garland in here. Go ahead, Garland. Uh, Terry brings up a really good point that we don't talk about. There's a term that's used, um, particularly in developing com- com- countries, called, uh, that is called brain drain. Whereas companies, uh, countries such as the United States and the developed countries, actually drain the the intellectuals and the um, the the uh, skilled uh, people, uh, you know, and, 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 and knowledgeable and skilled uh, labor and 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 uh, workforce from the country. So you know, whether it's India or Bangladesh or wherever, our policies are moving towards saying, well, if you are a poor person. Um, we are, we won't take you, but if you're a doctor or if you're someone that could have have a, you know tremendous benefit to that particular society, well, we'll take you and let those people suffer, which is in itself uh, unethical and, more, and, and, and immoral. But but I think this all goes together for this reason. It, 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 when you think back, if you were in you know 1800 and you were buying you know cheap cotton garments that were made in in, in the New York area because at that time we we kind of worldwide we controlled the market in cotton garments because we got slave we had slave labor so if you were buying that you're supporting it one of the issues is consumerism we want all this cheap stuff and we're willing to turn our heads we will look at these horrible things ha- that happen and we'll turn our heads and at least Terry and I, you know, that we've discussed on this show, making an attempt to avoid this stuff when possible, as hard as it is. But most people out here just simply say, "Well, let me go find the cheapest stuff." Oh, it's horrible what's happening in Bangladesh. Oh, wait a minute, this is only fourteen ninety nine. I'm not going to read where it's made. It's, there's consumerism. It's all working. Yeah, together. but here, here's the problem. It seems to me that in a country where uh, some ninety three percent of the wealth earned since uh, George Bush was chosen president by the Supreme Court in two thousand, some ninety three percent of that wealth went to the top one percent, with the other seven percent uh, generously distributed among the other ninety nine percent, mostly to the top two and three uh, percent. In that case, we have middle class wages stagnant, going down. Obviously, a few very rich people making enormous sums of money. So the American people are poor. So they say, you know, the people in Bangladesh, they're poor, or the people in Walmart right here in America are earning very low wages, but I'm poor too, so I have to go. So basically what you have is a few very rich people in the United States and around the world, but but largely the United States, making us all fight each other, making the 99% fight the 99% here in this country because Walmart's cheap, but they mistreat their workers, fighting the 99.9% in Bangladesh and India and China. So what's interesting is that I, I understand a middle class American. Americans saying, look, I, I can only afford fourteen ninety nine. I can't afford the eighteen ninety nine that it costs for made in America. And the irony is they're basically causing us to fight amongst ourselves, this very, very small group of privileged people. One, you, you make an excellent point, Mark, and one thing people should read is prior to the Revolutionary War and afterwards, for that matter, but depending exactly on how you count it, between 90 and 95 percent of Americans were living in poverty. Between 90 and 95 percent were in poverty, and that is deliberate. That is not something that happens by accident, and it's becoming deliberate now because, yes, the American public, and and this is around the world this is happening, the middle class's wages are being pushed further and further and further down, which therefore justifies paying laborers somewhere else to decrease their wages further and further down. And you are pushed. All you're really doing, as you pointed out, is we're feeding the top 1%. We're feeding the top 1, maybe 2, maybe 3, maybe even 20%. But 80% of the people in this country and the world are in a downhill trend that is being pushed by private industry with government collusion. And somehow this really has to be identified. We are pushing and creating the, uh, what we call, what, uh, what Pope Francis called, legal slavery. And that's all it boils down to, where the worker is totally dispensable. 
But when we're all fighting each other, uh, American poor and middle class people are fighting the the poor of of Bangladesh and India and China and Mexico. And basically, 99.9% of the world's population is fighting amongst itself for the tiny little bit of wealth that's allowed uh, all of us. Uh, I mean, Garland, what's the way out? What, What solution is out there? Well, you know, uh, Mark, uh, that is a uh, very significant question there, and God only knows if I had the answer, uh, you know, I, I, I'd certainly uh, put it forth. I'm sure Terry does, but I don't. But, <laughs> <laughs> I like to ask the questions that I myself can't answer. See, that's, that's, yeah, that's part, of, that's, that's but, part but, of my yeah. trick. See, well, I get a question is, I can't answer, I throw it out to y'all, and, I'm, and I sound really smart because I've asked a tough question, and uh, then you can't answer it, and I, I win twice. So but that's, the point that's been made here is that as we look at Bangladesh as, as, as you know, uh, a, 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 a uh, capitalist slavery country that is, you know, uh, happens as a result of the, 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 the um, uh, uh, um, appetite, worldwide appetite for cheap goods. Um, the point that you made about what's happened and what our economy has, been co- has, has become demonstrates that we are, in fact, becoming Bangladesh. We are, you know, there are different degrees of what Bangladesh is. You know, we, these kind of feudalistic societies where there's a tiny, tiny group of very wealthy people and everyone else is um, poor or peasants or serfs. We are identical to Bangladesh. We are identical to these countries that are doing this. We are just on a different degree. If everybody in a country has a thousand dollars, I mean, if a tiny group in a country has a thousand dollars and everyone else has one dollar, or if ever, uh, if if if, every, if if a tiny group in a country has a hundred thousand and everybody has one thousand, it's the same thing. It's just a different degree. So we need to be concerned and we need to recognize we are no different than. So, but let me throw it back at you. At a, at a level, different level. How can you tell somebody not to go to Walmart or not to buy a garment that's fourteen ninety nine made in Bangladesh uh, when the made in USA is more expensive? You can say to a rich liberal, sure, don't harm people. You know, be good. Uh, we, 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 we can't let people suffer who, you know, but uh, you're talking about a, a, a someone who's struggling to get by in America, which is at least half the country, if not more. Uh, then aren't we just sort of having poor people or lower middle class people fight each other? Well, we're stuck in that situation, and it's what the Occupy movement, as weak as it was, was all about. And there was a brief moment there when people were beginning to recognize the reality. You know, we are still the wealthiest, most powerful nation in the world. Not for much longer, but we are. (laughs) You know, and at that, we do have enormous political, economic, moral force if we take moral attitudes, if we don't destroy our moral capital. One of the things we should be doing is demanding that our companies here make sure that some regulations and some degree of safety and maybe even some degree of wage is you know provided for by comp- by them outsourcing to other places we can set the standard but we've got to become aware of the fact that we're talking about today of what is happening to all of us and that this is a real economic problem it comes down to again supporting the common good than the common good worldwide as opposed to just me the individual and if we don't start thinking about that and realizing that we are being exploited that we are being pushed into a situation of fighting each other for the, for the crumbs so you know let them eat cake you know, if we don't realize that, then we are going to wind up exactly the same situation. So what's the answer? Take back our government? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm take back the government, but be honest and open about it. I mean, you know, again, what Americans don't do, and I just saw a brilliant play about this, which you guys I recommend highly, and I wish I could remember the name of it, I'd tell you about it. But anyway, it's played Broadway and everywhere else. The point is we don't talk about the real issues. We don't talk about, we don't say things as bold as Pope Francis said, that the United States of America is supporting slavery in Bangladesh. We have to say these things. We have to be honest and open and bold with these things so that we realize what the consequences are. Can I be honest and open and bold here? And, and, and I, I, have, I have a startling admission. I did not hear Pope Francis say this. Uh, no. what, was this in the newspapers? I, oh, I, I, yes. no, I really don't doubt you, Terry. I'm not. But my yes. point is this, this hasn't gotten a lot of press. That I, you're I, damn right it doesn't. They don't want it to get press. Yes, Pope Francis, it was in a private... Um, well, I'm not sure what the name for it was, but it's a association with oh. a, a number of people, a religious moment, you know, a spiritual moment, a spiritual discussion. I, he was leading, and talking. they got talking about Bangladesh, and he came up, he said, "With this is, you know, atrocious, this is horrible, this is legal slavery. The significance of that statement, besides him just saying it, 
is that the Vatican immediately published it. That is significant, and this is one rare leader who's not tied yes. to corporations who can say such things. Uh, but uh, I somehow I don't hear many Catholic Americans repeating that assertion. Garland, well, you know, people don't want to face that fact. We don't want to face the fact that Jesus there's something wrong with me wearing these jeans that I'm wearing right now that were made in Bangladesh. Oh, I thought it's just because they don't look good on you, Terry. I didn't really want to tell you that. Um, but <laughs> Oh, don't you wish we had television? <laughs> I look wonderful today. Well, I have a video of me. I mean, we got to get y'all on Skype. Uh, so <laughs> yes, we can. Yes. Let me bring Garland in here. Garland, does the Pope, does that change anything? I don't know. I hope so. You know, but one of the things Terry just said I want to co- comment on, and, and it's something I believe strongly in, and that is when he mentioned we need to take our government back. And 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 you and and, you, and um, I started saying that when I heard the Tea Party members yelling, "We want our country back," and my answer was, "You never had it." Um, and when he, Terry says we need to take our government back, I think we need to face the realization that we never had it. We right. have a government that was that is always, and I think that's part of facing it. It's always been run by an elite wealthy class and you know it's it's a club that we're not in and i think we need to recognize that because it's really closing in on us and um, you know now so more than ever um we are on a track for a completely feudal society and no excuse me we're there and so i think we need to recognize it's not about necessarily taking our country back it's about recognizing that we never had it and that the only way we can change things we need and i don't mean this in a militaristic sense we need a revolutionary change um, in the way we think. And I, and, and, and I think that the only thing that's going to bring that, unfortunately, is the level of economic pain that's coming for the 93% um, will eventually get so The status quo will get so bad that nothing else, uh, you know, no, nothing else that can happen will seem a lot worse. And unfortunately, that's when we'll change. But we're heading for Bangladesh. Well, I think what you're saying, Garland, unfortunately, is that Mitt Romney was right when he said that uh, corporations are people. Because I think what he was saying then is when Abraham Lincoln said that government of the people, by the people, and for the people right, shall not yes. perish from the earth, he was really talking about corporations. So it all makes sense to to me now. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. When, when we come back, I want to get to some some uh, wild conspiracy theories. We've talked about real massacre in Syria and real slavery in Bangladesh, but Garland wants to talk about all the things that aren't occurring and that make us all so very upset. If you want to call in and join this discussion, you can at 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine and the Rockus Caucus, and we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back to the Rockus Caucus. This is Mark Levine with Terry Kester. Hey, and Garland Nixon. <laughs> they, I, they always speak at once. That's that's part of the fun that you get to do. See, I'm here in, in We Act Radio Studios right here in Washington, D.C., and then they're both on the phone. So I can just say with, and then they both speak at once. It's kind of like watching Laurel and Hardy buttheads. It's one of the. It's beautiful, too, though. It, it proves that Garland and I are unified. Uh, that's it's right. And that you both want. One spirit. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, so that, that's at least my conspiracy that I just caused. Uh, I, I don't, uh, Garland, you've got some more interesting conspiracy theories. Tell me about those. Well, a couple things real quick on conspiracy theories. If we look back in history and we, you know, the, um, the, the conspiracy theories in, in the late 1800s and early to mid-1900s about Catholics and how they were coming, you know, the Pope, et cetera, they were going to take over our country, um, you know, was used to, 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 to justify the persecution of Catholics in the right. U.S. The conspiracy theories about Jews and gold and the bankers were used by the Nazis and the anti-Semites in Europe during the during the, during the, the you know the early uh, part right. of the century. The um, conspiracy theories uh, have been used against so many groups: Asians, so, blacks, Latinos. I can name a conspiracy theory for every. The Irish back in the eighteen hundreds. Right. There are so, even conspiracies uh, against. Not conspiracies. to mention McCarthy. I mean, he had all the conspiracies. Communists, right? Right. Well, the guy, that candy maker guy uh, named Welsh, who said that um, Eisenhower was a communist and his brother was his boss in the Communist Party, and all this craziness. So we we can talk about conspiracy theories, but I think we should keep in mind that they are very dangerous and they have been used by some very net people for vener- for, for for nefarious reasons over the course of history. But I'll say this right now: we have, and, and what brought it to my attention is some Facebook friends, Sandy Hook was all staged. 
What? That was, that was a oh, false. No, flag. no way. Frost and bombings. That was false for the. This is the term they use. False flag operation. That was the government. Everything that has happened. It's interesting. The 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 the, the bombings were on TV, and and I barely knew what happened. And I looked on Facebook, and there were these people saying it's obvious that the government has done this, and they um had you know still pictures of like some fuzzy thing in the background saying see that proves it um and i think we're in a wow time now wow i see um, i understand why the nra doesn't want people to think newtown occurred and i understand maybe why tsar Naev's aunt and uncle and you know in russia or their parents don't want to believe this occurred but if you don't have a vested interest in not having events occur, and you know, cameras ar- around the world are recording this thing. Plus, it wasn't just CNN and 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 uh, headline news and MSNBC and Fox and and every and local stations. It was individuals sending out photos. I, I had a friend who ran in the Boston Marathon. I mean, sending out tweets. People. I mean, how can people deny such obvious reality? Because they well, don't want that, to in the first okay. place. Well, you know, one of the things that's happening here too, and I'm sure you've read about it, was the vigilante of the social vigilanteism of the social media in that people put out you know faces and pictures and names of people that they thought were the bombers and some of these people actually got harassed and some of these people actually got arrested and it was nothing more than social media mayhem so people i mean the real message here is social media is as dangerous as it is beautiful and we've got to realize that. Garland, what do you think's going on? Yeah, but the other thing is, Mark, uh, what you're saying, I, you know, is uh, I believe it was Voltaire that said, any belief that is not founded in logic and reason will not be swayed by it. When you say start giving us these rational reasons why these conspiracy uh, theories, some of them don't make sense. Um, you're wasting your time because with these people, with, with these conspiracy theorists, and it, 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 it's become like a growing movement in America. And it, it's alarming to me because everything now is a conspiracy theory. It's the, I mean, the government, God only knows, did absolutely everything. And, um, yeah, it, it's, to me, it's, it's, it's uh, I think, a result of um, people being afraid, people seeing these large entities such as corporations take control, people feeling the loss of control in their life and being afraid. And they can come up with all these conspiracy theories and they can say, there is someone that I can say d- has, w- is responsible for this. Um, these aren't just random acts. Somebody's responsible, and we can hold somebody accountable, and somebody can be punished, and I can n- be less afraid. But See, it's become I, pathological. I remember after September 11th, all the people that claimed that the United States government had set charges to take down the World Trade Center, that, 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 that there was no plane that flew into the Pentagon, despite the fact that there's video of plane flying into the Pentagon. I, I, you know, and, and there's video of planes flying in the World Trade Center. And and because the Bush-Cheney regime used 9-11 for their own nefarious purposes, which they clearly did, people said, aha, the fact that they used this horrible tragedy for their own nefarious ends means that they set the charges in the first place. One doesn't follow from the other. Sometimes bad people take advantage of awful situations. That doesn't necessarily mean that they, that they started those. And so you get these on the left, you get them on the right, and I guess I need to ask you, Garland, uh, who are your Facebook friends? Because, uh, <laughs> you know, I, most of the people that I normally associate with don't believe this nonsense, so Maybe maybe uh, you need to hang out with a better class of people. I don't know what. what am I? Uh, I mean, seriously, Garland. Who? who uh, I think the people who believe this tend to be the more marginalized of our society, who've had some really hard times, some hard knocks, and maybe um, you know are, are crying. It's a cry for help, I guess, isn't it? Uh, well, I, I think two things. Number one, I think initially, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, there are people who I would classify to the level of some sort of. Um, Paranoia and mental illness. Sure. At some point. It go, you know, with some of these absurd conspiracy theories. And they're on the left and the right. I don't think this is a, a, a yeah. liberal conservative thing. The fact that it is growing, um, it, it's growing, you know, because if you read uh, Richard Hofstadter's The pa- Paranoid Style, when he talks about the paranoid style, which is a great essay, one of the things he discusses is the fact that there are pe- the, the issue that there are people who seem otherwise normal and are otherwise in their lives per- perfectly normal. That will grasp some really absurd conspiracy theories. But I do believe that what is happening with, as a result of this kind of corporate takeover of, of, world, of our governments worldwide, I do think that is fueling the fear 
of average people, and it is making people who would not otherwise believe in some of these more absurd conspiracy theories, who are afraid, who, or they all, everybody now works for a corporation. Everybody's afraid they're going to get laid off on any given day, and that the, the, the um, officers of the corporation are going to take a $5 million bonus because they laid off all of their employees, which, ha- which happens every day. I think that is fueling the paranoid movement. See, here's, here's my concern. It's also, it's also yeah. though, guys, you know, you know, this is a real social psychological problem that somehow the, the country and individuals have to face. We are caught in a time and an era that is incredibly, increasingly more and more complex. And the more complex it gets, and the more threatening, therefore, it gets, and the more powerless we feel, mm-hmm. therefore, the more we seek simple answers. And you brought up the idea of, the, uh, of 9-11. Um, I hate to mention there was a radio station that I was closely, intimately associated with for years <laughs> and broadcasting for years. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. Where I guarantee you I was the only person, and I was doing it with scientific evidence, and including having worked in a lab myself, studying concrete and compression of concrete, et cetera, et cetera. I was the only one at that particular radio station that was dismissing or refuting any of the conspiracy theories at 9-11. Everybody else, I won't say 100%, but almost everybody else on the air was pushing the conspiracy theories about 9-11. Let me, let me tell you my concern. It has to do with 9-11 conspiracy theories or conspiracy theories about Newtown or the Boston bombing or any of these theories. Here's my concern. There are real bad things happening out there. Yep. Terry, We just did. Uh, you just mentioned slavery in, in Bangladesh. You just did an episode on all the way you know, corporations are basically enslaving workers. We've done stories on Walmart, Garland. In, in the aftermath of September 11th, I was still talking about the theft of our election in 2000, which was a conspiracy, but it was real. A conspiracy, yep. of course, is when a group of people get together behind in secret and do nefarious things. In this case, the Supreme Court openly said, you know, we don't like that Gore won the election. Let's put in Bush instead, and we don't need any law to back it up. Now, that was happening, and then nine months later came September 11th, and what always happens with the conspiracy theories is they drown out the legitimate horrible yes. conspiracies going on. There is money. There's the Koch brothers buying the LA Times. That's a terrible thing. There's Yep. All the money going on in our politics. There is the fact that the Supreme Court stole an election. There are all these awful things going on. And what I found would happen, when, and I was on the radio back in 03. I'm coming up on my 10-year anniversary, actually, in June in radio. Uh, but when I was that on the— you, what, 27? Uh, that makes me 27, right, because, again, yeah. I was 17. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that, Terry. Uh, but um, the point was is that what they would do is first they throw out the stupid conspiracy theory that— you know, Dick Cheney was laying bombs at the World Trade Center. Dick Cheney's evil, but he's evil in much more secretive ways. Thank you yeah. very much. Uh, th- you know, that, that he, and then people would say, you know, this idea that uh, the World Trade Center was blown up by Dick Cheney, that uh, George Bush stole the election, that Walmart is somehow evil, that climate change somehow exists, that Newtown didn't exist, and that the moon landing didn't happen. And what they do is they mix legitimate, real, progressive concerns about real, awful things going on in the world with... With these crazy conspiracy theories, it's a great way to dismiss them all. Bush didn't steal the election because you're crazy if you think September 11th wasn't caused by Al Qaeda, and and that's my. And so I tell people on the left, you're harming the cause. You don't yes. do any good by saying Bush and Cheney secretly put put explosives in the World Trade Center. That doesn't help us fight Bush and Cheney. It harms us because it makes all of us making legitimate arguments against them look like we're crazy too. I think we're always looking for that simple answer. I was going to say, I think what Terry said uh, brings up the kind of bridges the connection there also, because the feeling of powerlessness, you know, these things are connected. All these terrible, frightening things are happening, you know, uh, going on. And um, generally, you know, I've read a lot on conspiracy theories lately, and one of the connections is exactly what Terry said, people feeling powerless, powerlessness, people feeling that they have no power over their own lives. And this gives them some, uh, you know, ironically, paradoxically, it gives them the feeling of control when they can believe in these conspiracy theories. You know, it's very paradoxical that someone can say there's some shadowy conspiracy theory and now I feel in control. But they can bond with people who feel similar and... They can believe that there's not, nothing is random now. You know, it gets to the point with these conspiracy theories that absolutely nothing that happens is random. We've got people who believe there's a guy, David, I think it's Icky, I C K E. And he's the one that's going around uh, arguing that the Illuminati 
are 12 foot lizard people <laughs> who are uh, amazing. He's who completely are, wrong. They're only 11 feet tall. I mean, come on, let's not exaggerate here. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And if I'm not mistaken, I think Terry's one of them. I wouldn't be surprised. We've outed Terry with blue jeans. He, yeah, he but, didn't seem that tall to me, but well, li- li- lizard-like, I'll, I'll, I'll grant you that. <laughs> they wear blue jeans from Bangladesh, I think. Right. Uh, <laughs> arrow's pointing to Terry, Mark. All yeah. right, all right, fair but enough. Let, but, let, but let me add to that, because it's significant what's going on here, is one of the problems that we really are facing in this complex society is, in fact, the destruction of community. We form community on the web, which is not community, because what community means, whether it's with your family or with your neighbors, is you are engaging with people that you find out you don't like everything about them, but that's okay because you have common bonds and common interests. And so therefore you put up with the fact that they pick their nose when you're trying to discuss big political issues. Whatever it is, community involves this interaction between humans and we are being pushed further and further away from true community. And I mean specifically in terms of everything we've been talking about, whether it's conspiracies or labor or whatever. For instance, if you have a union and you belong to a union and you work with union members, you're not going to like everybody in the union. You're not going to agree with half of the people in the union, but you're going to be united and you're going to be getting information fed back to you. You're going to get cross-fertilization of intellectual ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can evaluate things. But when you just sit on your computer and social media, you can say, yes, Sandy Hook was a government-driven farce by Martian. See, Terry, I'm really glad you're attacking social media because that's a great segue. The inside scoop at 1.30 we're going to have offer. <laughs> Henry Sinkowitz, who's going to come on the air and talk about some of these dangers of social media and, uh, and how we have to. So thank you for that segue. I, I, I appreciate your planning that. And uh, yes, uh, he's, yes. he'll, he'll be on at 1.30 on the inside scoop. So listen Make sure up. he sends me my check. Listen okay. up for that. I'll, I'll ask him to do that, definitely. Okay. That's the other thing, too, I guess, that's probably that I didn't think about that Terry brought up that's fueling it. Now we have the Internet. So the fact of the matter is when, um, uh, you know, as soon as there's a bombing, some psycho can, you know, take these uh, stills that they get off of, you know, still frames that they get off of TV or whatever, and they can Photoshop them or manipulate them or, you know, point to an arrow to some guy standing there. I saw one. This is, this is going to kill me. to kill you. They, point, they, had a, they had some woman running from the bombing. And they had a picture yep. of some woman that was on CNN. And they said, this is the same woman who is the principal at Sandy Hook. She's an actress. And oh, she's my in a God. Of all these, you know, I mean, really just absurd stuff. But here's the problem. Within minutes after these things happen, it hits the Internet. It goes through these, you know, neurotic, psychotic communities of people. And they spread this stuff out. And um, it, it's just... It's, I mean, if you really pay attention to this, the people are, you know, we're ignoring it a lot. It's really getting out of hand. And I really? suspect some of the things that we see, some of the violent acts sometimes that we see, uh, some of it may be as a result of some of these kooky things. Well, you have on. a good point, because I think that, it, I mean, we still don't know all the all the details of what radicalized Tamerlan and, and, and Jokar at Sarnayev, but apparently the Internet is, is, is probably exactly. one of them. Well, we'll find out. You know, they're going and they're looking at this radical stuff on the Internet. I remember uh, as long ago as 05 or 06 when I first got the email that said that Al Gore uh, failed to finger uh, Osama bin Laden as a terrorist uh, and it turned out that, it, that Ali North said so and then you go and you actually look at the reality he was talking about Abu Nida which was a completely different terrorist but at that time, I had relatives sending this email all around. I, I happen to have a few relatives who, sad to say, are of the conservative persuasion. I, I've tried to, I begged them to change. But, but the point is that these false things started going around the internet, and that's when I learned the wonderful website Snopes.com, which yeah. actually is around to, to uh, defangle these, defangle, is that a word? To untangle and defang, is I guess what I meant to there say. Uh, the, these, these horrible... Uh, lies and conspiracies that that are out there and so um the, well, that's the real problem. That's the real problem, Mark. Because I mean, I have relatives that I, you know, I'm very close to, and you know, uh, uh, are, hold on, I, we, we, hang on, hang on. We're finishing up this radio show, and you'll be on in okay, just a second. Okay, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry, this is yeah. my next guest, uh, but but go go ahead, uh, Terry. Yeah, just that, you know, I have some relatives and brothers, and I think that are you know very intelligent, very successful people, and but at the same time, they don't look beyond what they want to believe. And, you know, what I try to persuade people, at the very least, if you read anything on the Internet, if you read that the sun rose this morning, check it. 
double check it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you cannot take the, and this is what's really sad, and it's being pushed by one other factor, which I want to bring in real quick, and it's, it's frightening to me because it's part of the same problem, even though it may not sound like this, added, this new procedure we have where everything we hear about, be it about weapons or be it about um, you know, chemical weapons or whatever, you get this wonderful quote, the U.S. officials spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to discuss the matter publicly. In other words, we don't even have responsible people taking responsibility for what is being said, quote, officially. We have this random condemnation, this random judgments by people. We don't even know who the heck they are. It's all part of the same game of not taking the time to double-check, triple-check everything. Well, let, me, let me throw this in there, too, because yeah. this is very important. You know, a few months back, Michelle Bachman said that she thought that there was going to be, there may be re-education camps for our youth in America. Wow. We had some kooky Republican the other day say that um, the government is buying up all of the, um, uh, the, the bullets so that we can't use them to defend ourselves from the government. <laughs> So you've got these Tea Party people and these crazy people who, for the, who I would like to say that they're doing it for political reasons. Unfortunately, I think they really believe this stuff. Yes. So you well, well, let me ask you this question. Though. We only got a couple of minutes left. So let me just pose this one last question to you on this. And then that's this. We live in an age of social media. We live in an age, and this is a great segue to what's coming up next in the Inside Scoop, which is discussion with Syrian activists who are protesting in front of the White House. We can't get legitimate press into Syria because the Syrian government kills them all. So we rely on Twitter. We rely on Skype. We rely on YouTube videos taken of action in the streets. At the same time as legitimate people uh, are putting out real reporting that that, that actually, you know, CNN reporters can't get to. We also have wild and crazy people putting out conspiracy theories and using these same media tweets and YouTube to put out crazy notions. So my, my last question, uh, let me end it with you, Garland, since you started this. How do we determine what's true and what's not true? The bottom line is there has to be, you know, some level of, uh, of reality um, you know, it, it's about the person who's reading it. I think a lot of these conspiracy theories aren't about the conspiracy theory itself. It's about the person who's reading it, their psychological profile. And it, they kind of take advantage of people who are already somewhat weak-minded, paranoid, and, 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 and very much frightened. So, so Terry, just, how do you tell the difference between what's true and what's false? You just need to have the father that I had who told me at the very, very, you know, long time ago, back in the Stone Age, back, he said, Terry, he said, Terry, you believe half of what you read, <laughs> half of what you see, nothing of what you hear. I think at the end of the day, you have to go by what has worked in the past. You know, the New York Times has generally gotten it right. Not always, but when they don't get it right, they issue a correction, and this is a source you can trust. Yeah, only after we've gone to a war in Iraq. We, I, got to, you know, I tell you something. If, if a friend of mine tells me something and that friend is generally truthful, then generally I can believe them. And if but a right, friend of mine they, lies to me a lot, then that's the guy I'm not going to believe. And, and at the end the of the New York Times is part of the conspiracy, along with you and Terry, I might add. Uh, you know, Garland, <laughs> I think you, by bringing this up, have hidden your own... Uh, conspiracy-minded thing, and that was a very clever thing to do, but I'm not falling <laughs> for it. So, yeah, well, my big conspiracy is I'm getting younger and younger, and you guys don't even know it. Uh, you know, after you leave, I think after you live past 100, it flips, right? Like on the car <laughs> and the odometer. And that's it why does. you think you're young. You think yeah. you're 23. You're actually 323. I'll so see I, you on the slope, <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for coming here on the Rockets Caucus. Coming up next is the Inside Scoop. Uh, we're gonna, we got a lot going on there. We've got uh, the issue in Syria and what the United States should do there. We've got whether or not we should be uh, unentangled from the internet and we have my own comments on the first uh, pro basketball player to come out as gay, Jason Collins. So a terrific show coming up. Uh, then the inside scoop right after this. Thank you, Mark.